I'm super excited to talk about this event, which is Unlocking Your Theory of Change. This is an event where we get to be a little bit dirty and really go deep into the, into the why question. Like, how do we enable our organizations to do more, more effectively, and then measure that impact? And to go into those questions, we've invited our guest expert, Juan Jose Heed from Community LLP, because you think you don't have time to measure your program's impact, but actually today we're going to talk about an actionable model that will allow you to measure your day-to-day -day program delivery. So Juan is an expert in purpose-driven business strategies and digital transformation. His passion lies in creating a better world by helping organizations align their vision with impactful digital strategies and sustainable practices. He specializes in organizational innovation management, guiding nonprofit organizations like yourself in creating and validating new products and services. We're about to go deep. We're going to do this for the next 40 minutes. We'll have some time for sure for Q&A. Thank you. As Eli mentioned, I'm really passionate about this. So just a heads up, if I start talking like really fast, it's because I really like this. So that's basically where I'm at. So what are we going to do today? We're going to look about a little bit briefly about the nerdy part of the evaluation components. Then we're going to understand what a theory of change is. Then how do we build one? How do we actually measure that? And how do we pitch in a way that makes sense for getting support, just those being donors, volunteers, or just getting the community more engaged in what we're doing. First of all, who am I? I've been working in, in startup, social enterprises, and impact measurement and innovation since around 2014. I, I would say the shift occurred between 2014 and 2015, where I transitioned from being a sociologist to focusing on business. And I realized the importance of measuring impact and working with social enterprises. I've been supporting nonprofit social enterprises uh, to launch their projects, validate their business models and secure funding and measure their impact, most importantly. I currently work as an ideal coach. And even though I really like working with purpose driven organizations, I am now transitioning more to a business therapist approach. like helping more people understand their emotional and psychological roadblocks rather than the processes themselves between tools and, and the techniques. More about what's, what is it about the person in the organization that we're not doing said thing. I've lived in Victoria since around two and a half years ago. I have two young kids in the picture. <laughs> I am originally from Chile, therefore my accent. And I love reading, calisthenics and hiking. So I guess Victoria is a really good place for going hiking all the time. Now let's go ahead and the theory of change. Evaluation components. So every program has different evaluation components. One, it's about the needs evaluation, which is understanding what's the problem and what are the goals and the objectives of the program. Another is more about a theoretical evaluation. What should happen in theory to solve the problem? Then we have the process evaluation. Is my program being implemented as planned? How, what can we do better? Then we have the impact evaluation or also called impact assessment which is basically about understanding if the program met the needs and what is the magnitude of the impact. And lastly, we have the cost benefit analysis where we understand what are the, given the impacts and cost, how can this program be compared to the alternatives? Between these five things, where do you think the theory of change falls under? Someone can write it on the chat. That's great. If not, I'm just gonna keep going. The theory of change falls under the theoretical program evaluation which is how in theory we can solve the problems that we're trying to, to that, that we observed. So what is a theory of change? First of all, we need to understand that a theory of change is a roadmap that tells us where we're going for the results or the impact. How do we get there? What's the process behind it? And what are the things that need to happen for us to get to that place, which are the assumptions? It is a visually creative process about the intended change. And it's a reflective and critical process on the preconditions on what is the path that we need to follow for creating the intended change. It's all about the, what's the intended impact we want to create. It's also semi-structured and flexible as a way of understanding what are the link strategic actions that get uh, into a certain chain of results, what action uh, forces the other one to happen. And it's also a monitoring and evaluation tool. What is not a theory of change? A theory of change is definitely not the absolute truth on how the change we want to accomplish has to look 
or how do we want it to occur? It's just in theory. We always need to keep on validating and assessing that what we're actually intending to happen, intending to make, it actually happens. And it's not a definite recipe that eliminates every uncertainty or complexity that arises in any process of social change. It is not the absolute truth at all. It is a roadmap that allows us to flexibly understand or theorize or create hypotheses on how to get to a certain end result or even. And now how do we build one? And this is where there are many, there are different approaches to a theory of change. Some people start from the back. Some people start from the beginning. Some people don't take into account the vision. This is the process that I came up with after working with different organizations. And this is what I've seen works better for most of them. First of all, we can, have, we can start with a vision or with some, something else, but I usually like to start with a vision. We usually start with the vision. This is for creating the theory of change for the organization. And the importance of starting with the vision is that it allows us to understand what would the world look like when our initiative is successful and how would a world where our, exist, where our existing problem is no longer needed, where we don't longer, we don't longer, we're basically working ourselves out of the job. That's like the vision we're trying to accomplish. It is a crucial aspirational aspect that we need to keep in mind and in sight for moving forward. After understanding what's the vision that we're trying to create for organization and for the world that we want it to look like, we need to understand what is the problem and target audience we're focusing on. And this is, this is depends on the organization. You can start with the need and the problem in mind, or you can start with the vision. It depends on you. But basically the problem and the target audience is about asking ourselves the questions, whose life are we changing with our existence? Our target audience and what problem are we solving? What is our target audience? And what are the needs that are based in the context of the initiative? What, what need we want to face? What are the things that we're actually tackling? It is also related to the final goal of the project. And the needs are something that are specifically to our target population and that it, and they can be measured. We can observe them in real life. It's not just a theory. Like we observed a real problem and therefore we established our organization focused on solving the problem. After that, something that also helps organizations is to understand a certain or define a certain accountability ceiling. Let's say that our vision is a world with, where poverty doesn't exist. That probably is not something we're going to be able to make happen in this lifetime, but it serves as a guiding aspect for what we're doing. And what can be, what can we be accountable for? is how do we make that vision come true? And that's what we call our mission. So basically the mission is the aspirational goal that is guiding us to accomplish what we see as the vision, which is something that we're probably never going to be able to accomplish. And basically the accountability ceiling or mission guides us towards something that we can do or that can define our behavior. And therefore everything else that we do should be aligned with our mission, which creates more alignment in the whole organization. We can start with the inputs. What are the inputs that we need? What are the things that we need to accomplish our vision being guided by our mission? So basically inputs are all the human and economic and or financial resources that we need for the project or for our organizations to exist and to take place. For example, let's say we have a program that involves schools. We need teachers. We need classrooms. We need computers. We need students. We need to have internet access and several other things. So the, the basic things that we need to have so that our project can even start. Okay. Second, we have the activities, which is basically what are the actions that we're taking for the project to, to take place? This is how we can describe the intervention. Let's say an activity can be like, we have classes for students. We distributed computers. We have immunization for kids. It's basically what are we doing with the inputs that we have in our target population? Then we have the outputs, the project which are basically the, the intermediate, the, the immediate, sorry, results from activities and outputs. Sometimes the way they sound is as if we were rephrasing the activities, but the emphasis is on the thing that it's being delivered. For example, we saw on activities like classes for students. In this case is classes being delivered, beneficiaries trained, amount of people using a computer instead of distribution of computer. How many people are actually using a computer? That's an output. The number of training centers developed. I think that are, are still easily measured and easily observed by us. After that, it gets more complex all the time. We start with the outcomes and some people call them the immediate changes or like the intermediate results. 
there's a whole jargon here in terms of impact, outcomes, results, goals. And we can talk about that on another time because it's more aligned into what impact investing can be. But for the sake of this presentation, let's just talk about outcomes as the immediate changes that occur through during because of our intervention. These have been changes in attitudes, knowledge, capabilities or skills, and changes in behavior that are usually and changes in behavior that are like more long lasting are usually the focus from an impact evaluation, not from a theory of change perspective. And lastly, we have the impact. And this is generally the change we want to create and what is the change in the state of development of our target population. This is the reason why our project exists, for example. And some people can say my impact is to increase people's happiness. Then how do we measure that? I'm going to see that in a bit. But the important thing about the impact is that they are related, relatedly direct, direct, sorry, relatedly and they're directly related to the needs of the population. And this is the, the area we should be accountable for when measuring our impact to understand the project itself was successful or not. This is where we can actually be accountable for if what we're doing makes sense towards uh, our goal and according to a target population and the vision. We have. And lastly, we have the assumptions. Assumptions are are key external and positive things that need to happen so that our project can take place in the way that we, that we expect. What needs to be true in the program to deliver the expected impact? For example, we're training people for them to get a job. We are assuming an assumption is that if we want to train people to get the skills so they can get a job, one assumption is that they will actually apply for a job or that they will want to find a job. There's no reason on just training people to get a job if we don't think that they're going to actually apply for a job because what's the impact then? And that's an assumption and we need to be really aware of that. And this is something really interesting because most of the times the assumptions are just so obvious to us that we don't write them down in the project and we just take them for granted because they are assumptions. We are assuming that they, that we expect them to happen. But it's really interesting to observe that when sometimes we have an intervention in a set group of people, if we go and ask them what are their expectations, sometimes they don't link with our assumptions. So it's really important to validate our assumptions with the target population or with other stakeholders. We can also have hypotheses that these are, again, conditions that we expect to be true that can help our theory of change happen in the population that we're serving. It is not necessary to create hypotheses, but it helps to keep them in mind when crafting a theory of change. For example, if we do A, B, or C, and these conditions, these assumptions are applicable, then we will create an impact. That's the, the hypothesis that's guiding our own work. If we do A and the assumptions are true, then we will see A, B, or C as an impact. And the other is because some people usually uh, create a theory of change from the backwards, like what's the vision or what's the mission, then what's the impact that we want to take? What are the outcomes that we need for this impact to be true? What are the outputs that we need to create certain outcomes? What key activities do we need to, to create and what needs to happen for getting to certain outputs? And what are the inputs? What are the minimum resources that we need for getting those activities started? Now, let's give an example. This is, these are groups to boost savings among people with low levels of income. This is a real example from Chile. And the problem they, that was identified is that there was low level of savings. And there's an inability to withstand financial shocks and emergencies and their scarcity of mechanisms that help people to commit to savings. What is the vision of the program itself? We can say that the vision is a world where everyone has enough savings to live a life stress-free. That would be amazing. Can we get there at some point in our lives? We don't know. What guides us? What, are, what is the thing that is guiding us? Our mission, which is basically helping people to save money. That's simple. And it's easy to be accountable for that because in every interaction that the organization makes or that any person of the staff of the organization makes with one of the beneficiaries, that should be the key guiding principle, the key guiding goal or the North Star. I'm going to help you save money, like in every way. So what is the impact we're trying to, to attain? We're trying to help people to have the ability to respond to shocks and emergencies. And another impact we want to have stable consumption level. And then we can see how do we measure this? What does this mean? What are the outcomes that we're trying to make with this program of helping people save more money? Increasing number of savings accounts, that's something measurable. 
We also want to increase the number of deposits. Yeah, makes sense. We can have people save more money, but we also want to increase the amount of deposits. And we want to increase the amount that is being deposited. And we want to increase, uh, to have an increase in the amount that's being saved. This is pretty, pretty simple to observe. We can have more savings accounts opened, but if people don't save any money, then what's the point of just measuring the, uh, the amount of saving accounts open? And for example, now out, how do we get to these outcomes? We, what we need to happen, we need customers to open savings accounts. That's one of the things that need to happen so we can have more savings accounts. We need people to open them. We need people to establish their saving goals. If we don't have any goals, how can we know if we're being successful or not? We need customers to announce the goal to the group. So there's a more like a cohesive group dynamic and the group to verify the goal commitment. So therefore we're establishing support in the groups. Remember, these are peer-to-peer -peer support groups for helping people save money. What activities do we need to happen to create those outputs? We need to create self-help groups. We need to have the groups of people. We need to, be, to give classes and information about savings. And we need to establish saving goals and also develop a savings plan. If none of this happens, then we go and get the outputs. And what are the key things we need so that we can have self-help self -help groups, classes and information about savings, establishing savings goal and developing a savings plan. We need savings accounts. If we don't have the possibility to open savings accounts, then none of this will work. We also need people to go into this group. We need teachers. We need classroom. We need training material. We need saving targets and goals. And one of the assumptions here is that there is a desire to save. People want to save. If just people just go to the group and they say they want to save, but they don't actually have a desire to do, none of the behaviors will change and we're never going to reach our impact and we are never going to have help to, to accomplish the vision. Also, the customers have time to assist the meetings. What if someone really has the desire to save, but they can't go to the meeting because they don't have time? Then again, the problem's solved. And what if customers don't have the ability to save? We're assuming that they have the ability to save or that they will have. Then again, the problem will fall short on the deliverables. And the customers gather savings to face a crisis. That's another thing. If they only save money, not to withstand a financial crisis or not to stand like a financial shocks or scarcity by the end of the month, then there's no meaning. They're just saving money to, to buy uh, the latest piece of technology for themselves, for example. That's not something that they actually need for their families. Then there's also no help they're going to make in this group to have an impact. How do we measure this? We can come up with different grids. And this is one that it's plainly, I don't want to say, yeah, it's, simple it's not always easy but when we understand these three things are the most simple to measure which are the inputs the, sorry the inputs the activities and the outputs basically an input has as we saw on the last example can be saving account we can measure them by number of saving accounts and then we get an, indi an indicator saving account number of saving accounts number of people activities creating groups how many meetings do we have how many groups are we possibly creating then an output, like how many savings accounts were open, how many groups were created. This is something that's plainly and directly observable during our whole program and intervention. When it gets trickier is when it's about outcomes and impact. For example, if we talk about being, how do we understand well-being? What does well-being mean? And this is when we understand what's the concept behind it and what and how do we understand it. And there we can, this is called operationalization. And then we can divide it into different groups. For example, being can be in the financial aspect, in the emotional aspect, and in the social aspect. And for example, one, one indicator of well-being in the financial aspect will be, for this example, how much money did you save last month? If it was greater than set amount, then we could say that we have success. If the person felt support from their immediate support network of family members, then we're also having an impact in well-being. And the person felt more safe within themselves and they restrain from spending money on things that they might possibly not need, then that's also a good question to, to write down. So we can understand how do we break this down. We're going to see an example in a bit though. So for example, let's say that we're measuring, we have a, a program that's a training program for, for school teachers in Kenya to lecture on HIV prevention. One of the inputs would be educational posters about HIV so that teachers actually have something to talk about. Another big input could be trainers and facilitators. 
what would be, for example, a good indicator of how do we, how could we measure educational posters about HIV? If anyone can post in the chat, what do you think would be a way of an indicator of measuring this input? Anybody? Okay. Silent crowd. <laughs> for example, one way of measuring this would be how many posters do we actually have for helping teachers to, to teach about HIV? How many trainers, how many facilitators do we have? That's a way of measuring this. Again, activities, teachers training on how to teach about HIV. How many activities do we have? How many support groups or training groups do we have about this? And the outputs, trained teachers. How many teachers were actually trained? And this is where we can also create a survey to understand what did they knew about the, about HIV prevention before starting the program, and then how much they know after going through the program. And we can make a comparison and then we can say, oh, so if, for example, we have a standard test to under, to, for them to know what are the basic prevention techniques for HIV, and they scored two out of 10 in the initial test, and then they scored eight out of 10, we could say that, that it's because of our program and then we understand how much they changed, just in terms of the input. Lots of st stats need to be gathered. That depends on the program itself, and there are ways to collect that information. You, there's statistics scan and there's not always a certain need to collect the statistics or certain evaluations. It depends. Many programs, when they talk about impact, what they're actually measuring is outputs. But people talk about impact, but they're actually measuring outputs. But again, if we go to the nitty gritty and get really detailed on things, when we measure impact, it, in most cases, should be about going directly to talk to the beneficiaries and understanding what are the things that actually changed for them. Yep. Thanks, Eli. And now let's go with another example. Okay. Now let's say that we have a study that's focused on drug consumption by school kids. I put the, the outcomes and impact together in this case to make it a, a more clear example. So we first talk about the difference between concepts, how do we define the concepts, what are the dimensions, and what are the questions. In this case, let's say that one of the big things about drug consumption in schools is how much parental involvement is in that because we can see that there might be studies about how parental involvement actually helps kids to get away, to get out of, stay out, stay out of drug consumption. So what does parental involvement mean in this case? We can define this as the behaviors that are focused on the attention given to activities and relationships with kids. That's, that's one of the things we can understand. Okay. So it's how do we measure the relationship? How do we measure the attention from parents or primary caregivers to kids? So this seems like to be like a broad definition still. So how can we break it down more even? One dimension can be parental vigilance and how we understand that parental vigilance. We can understand this from the question of after school, how many times a week do your parents not know where you are? It's a question for the school kids themselves. How many times a week do your parents or primary caregivers not know where you are? Never, almost never, sometimes, always, or almost always or always or almost always they know where I am. And then with parental communication, that can be another aspect of parental involvement and how we understand the parental behaviors. How would you describe the relationship you currently have with your parent? Excellent. Very good. Good. Not good enough. Bad. And again, we can still go into more detail about what does, a good, what does an excellent relationship look like for the person we're asking this, but we can get like some more of a clear understanding of what we're doing just by doing this. And again, from, I would say that honestly, from the majority of the nonprofits and social enterprises I've worked with, this is something that most don't do. Most just stay on the outputs level because it makes sense. It's easier to measure and we can say that if we have these outputs, then our impact is going to happen, but that's not necessarily true. And that's just an assumption that we have. So if you want to get more clear into what the organization is actually doing and how they're actually really supporting and making a change, it would be better to go to this level. And again, this takes more time, probably more resources, more alignment in the organization themselves to understand what's the real change they're making. And that's why the theory of change helps in the way of we're assuming that if one part of the theory of the steps of the theory of change occur, then the other things will fall into place too. We need to validate that though with the target population and just going out and asking them, but you can still have some sort of an assumption around that. 
Yep. Thanks, Elaine. Exactly. Now we're going to see a real example from one of, of the of the nonprofits I, I helped a while ago. So this person has a nonprofit that's based on Panama and one of the core principles of her, of her organization, this is done for one of the programs, is helping people in Panama get more access to resources that can be found on MIT, for example, or on Silicon Valley, because she grew up like in Silicon Valley and traveling to Panama, and that's like her purpose to bridge those gaps. But this program in particular is about the STEM bridge, which about science, technology, arts, mathematics, etc. And she understood that the need is that the youth and the young or the product of the target population is youth and young adults in Panama. There's a scarce access to technology, both in terms of tools and hardware, and there's a lack of education to use tech for creating wealth. That's like overall really clear what she's doing. What's the image of the world that she sees and what would she really want to accomplish? How can she get herself out of the job by breaking the cycle of poverty? And what is she actually doing to get to the place? What guides her? It guides her to provide access to technology and education to young people, families, and communities to provide pathways out of poverty. So that's her guiding principle or her mission in the way that she relates to everyone by providing access to technology and resources to young people and families for helping get out of poverty. So this is the way she will relate with everyone she comes across with. How can I help you to get access to these things that I know it exists, but you, but you don't know they exist? So basically that's what she's doing. What is the impact that she sees? She says that families and communities will become advocates for STEM education. Again, it's interesting to see this because when we think, what does advocate mean in this case for the program? What does this look like for the, from the founder of the nonprofit? And how would we expect people to become advocates? In which ways do we think they will become advocates? And, and what does that look like? The youth will be equipped with the tools, knowledge, and access to technology to build wealth for themselves. Again, what does, what does wealth look like and wealth for themselves or by themselves? Does this mean that they'll start their own startup or they will find a job? Are they going to move from the place they're living or they want to work remote? Lots of questions. We can see that it would be great for everyone to be like really happy. But how do we actually make this happen? And what is the real thing that we're making? What is the intended change and what is the unintended change? What are the outcomes of the project? Young people becoming certified and proficient in coding, robotics, and Cisco Netica. That's pretty simple and it's really measurable. Okay, so we're going to measure how many people actually become certified in coding. Great, we can have a standard test or we can go to a certification agency that can get those certifications from these people. Nice. Also, young people seek job in technology. That's another rock. We expect people to look for jobs. How can we measure that? By going and asking. How many times have you looked for a job this month? How many jobs have you applied? And then, then we can get the, the measurement on the tools. Families support young people in pursuing education and careers in STEM. Again, we can go and ask them, how, many how much support do you feel you have from your family? From a scale of one to 10, being one, no support at all, being 10, all the support. We can also go and talk with their families. How much support are you giving to your kids in this? And again, we can compare. And then communities develop STEM education as a cultural value and priority. This might be a little harder to measure, but again, we can still go and ask around the community how much these have changed in their life. What, how was, what was their life before the program and what was the life after the program? And then we can ask if they have been involved in any other program. And if not, we can even ask them how much of the change they think it's because of us. And then we can use the social return on investment framework to, to get to those details. And outputs, young people enroll in STEM programs, great. The youth has access to STEM labs. The family members and community leaders engage in STEM program outreach and dissemination. How do we measure that? But we can see. Fam family members and community leaders become involved on the value of STEM education. And we have a, a few more. What are the activities that we need so these outputs happen? We need to develop uh, a model of promotores and digital inclusion and STEM education. We need to develop that, that model. If we don't have that model, then we can't have any of the outputs. And if we don't have the outputs, we don't have the, the outcomes, then we have the impact and then we don't do anything. We can make any change. Also, we need the community evaluations and community presentations on the STEM bridge program. Be even more than having the programs created, we need to go to the community and present them. These are the things we've done. 
so we can get their approval and we can include them. If we don't do this, then we're not going to get the outputs, we're not going to have the outcomes, and we're not going to make the impact we expect. We also need to, to build an advisory council. Again, if we don't have the advisory council, many of these outputs and impact won't come. And this can be linked. For example, we can see that the advisory council might not have an impact of how much, how many people enroll in the programs, but it might have an impact on how family members and community leaders become advocates. So it's different, it depends on different parts of the program. It doesn't mean that just one makes the whole program fall apart. It might be one that's linked to others or one that's linked to two, then we have to break this down. And what are the things that we need for this? We need STEM labs. We need young people participating in STEM bridge programs. We need teachers. We need training promoters. We need training participants. We need training material. And we need a STEM curriculum. And what are the assumptions behind this for this to happen? Because we can have all these things and it can look wonderful on a presentation. But what are the assumptions? What are the things that we need to happen so that this takes place? There is a desire to learn STEM. The community members and family have time to participate. And young people are motivated to access and attend STEM lab. If we have everything, but people just don't want to go because for whatever reason, nothing of this will happen. In this case, we can see that the hypothesis that was guiding her program was if we give access to technology for the community by our STEM labs and the youth get trained and certified in COVID, in coding, robotics, and Cisco NetAcad, and they apply for tech jobs, then they will start new jobs in technology and create wealth for them and their families to escape the cycle of poverty. So this is like the, the theory that's guiding all of her action. If this happens and my assumptions are true, then we will create the impact that we are expecting. And this is just an example of her own breakdown structure. And I, this is on purposely in blank, so we can get, we could have done these exercises now, but I think that it, that maybe too much. <laughs> but yeah, for example, as inputs, she has teachers, hopefully 150 teachers she would like to have as training for this program. She hopefully would like to have 80,000 uh, participants every year. It's pretty achievable from her things. And again, we can see activities, for example, conduct a community evaluations and community presentations of the STEM bridge program. So what are the indicators? Amount of workshops, amount of focus groups, amount of interviews made by each promoter. How many onboarded students per workshop or per focus or per interview? How many contacts in each event? The number of people that present in events, the number of people that sign up versus the amount of people that show up. That's also a good ratio for the, for her to have as a success ratio or, or as a success indicator. If we have a hundred people that sign up, but only one show up, what are the things that we're showing when we're looking for funding? Are we showing that we have hundred percent signups or one percent show up? And that's, that's also interesting. Again, outputs. Young people enroll in STEM education program. Youth have access to STEM lab. And the outcomes. And this is where, it, where we talk about the concepts again. For example, increasing number of youth people becoming certified and proficient. What does proficiency mean? How do we measure proficiency in this case? Are we using an external test, an external questionnaire for this? Or are we creating our own? Or are we based on Cisco Nedaka training standards? What does proficiency mean? Increasing the numbers of families support young people in pursuing education and career system. What does family support look like for him? How much support do you feel your family is? How much support do you feel the family is with you to pursue higher education and a career in STEM? That can be like an open question for them. And from that open question, we can create like then like a survey. And again, the families and communities will become advocates for STEM. What does advocacy mean here? Is it talking about the program and its benefits or for STEM education? Are we advocating for the program, for having a program like this, or are we advocating for STEM education? Because if we are advocating for STEM education, then another program can potentially easily replace this. Is this what makes advocates in the community, the, pro the program that her nonprofit is given, or just STEM education per se? So that's small details that add up a lot and that make the offer unique and how we, do we communicate that and what makes people tick. And she has their assumption. There's a desire to learn STEM. Community members and family have uh, time to participate in training, outreach and advocacy, and the youth understand the value of getting into tech, for example. I'm just keeping an eye on the time because I want to finish with the pitch part and then we can open up for questions. Again, 
how do we communicate what our organization is doing? And as I mentioned before, there are several ways of making a pitch. We can have an innovator pitch or a business pitch, or there are different ways. Some people like to just say in one phrase what they do. Some people like to have hundreds of slides with an entire presentation and the corporate image and nice pictures of everything. Some people like to use a lot of, of stories. What's the success story or the impact story? And one of the, the presentation ways that I like the most that, I, that I've used different times, and I feel it's really impactful because it's really direct, succinct, simple, and straightforward is using a six slide pitch, which basically it communicates why our vision and our mission is important and how are they key for reaching more people, finding volunteers, donors, and supporters. And it starts like this. The first slide is about the why now, which is about creating urgency. It's about telling, and this, again, this is usually more focused on social enterprises and this still, it's still applicable to nonprofits. The difference is instead of selling shares, we're helping others to support the dream. We're like selling the participation in the dream or pitching the participation in the dream. So this is about urgency. Why now? Why is this an opportunity? Why is this new? Why is this urgent now? Why hasn't this been done in the past? And this is also an opportunity to show how urgent what you're doing is and what it couldn't have been done in the past. Second, what is the problem that we're solving? And here it's important to express clearly what is the thing that we are solving. And the listener or the person or the person we're pitching to should be able to understand the problem simply and directly. And it's really important here to be aware of how much passion we have for what we're doing because there are people that might not resonate with the passion that we have as founders, for example, but they might resonate with if the problem we are solving is important enough for them or not. So that's something that usually happens in nonprofits. People, sometimes it's hard to communicate how much we care for this, but it's a lot of emotions. How do we make it clear? That's how we need to get really clear the problem that we're solving. And then what do we actually do? This is how we get clear on what are the things that the actions that we're doing. And what specifically are we doing to solve the problems that we mentioned above? Focus and mention the things that we do well, like what's our competitive advantage or, or what makes us different. And we don't need to get too hung up in the details. This is still not completely high level, but mid-level. We don't get to the specifics of specifically what's the process or what's the roadmap of change, but just what we do. We plant trees or we solve the nature's problem in this way. And then we jump to the how which is still a high level strategy, but it talks about our secret sauce. Like what makes this different from others? What makes us stand? Like what is the proof? What are the things that we are doing that can give proof of that what we say we do, we're actually doing so? Or what's the size of the market if we're new in this? What's the size of the opportunity? Or and it's basically showing to others how committed we are with this. And then therefore taking the work that we do seriously because we are the real deal. And then the economic value or the ask. And after making all the other points clear and conveying all the other points, this is where we can actually ask for what we need. We can focus on asking for a donation or asking for volunteers or, or asking for whatever help we need. And we need to understand that when we get to this point, we're not looking for things out of pity because we're offering an opportunity for people to actually engage and participate in the change and impact that we were doing to be part of the dream, to be involved. It's not just asking out of pity for others to help us. It's because we're taking this seriously and we're making this happen. So let's give like a brief example of this. Let's say there's a nonprofit called Green Harbor and they nurture, they nurture Mater's Resort. Why now? And this is about the urgency. British Columbia has always been known for standing natural landscape but recent environmental challenges have threatened the ecosystems like never. And that's why the Red was born. What is the problem that we're solving? We're solving the problem of, the, of deforestation, habitat loss, and climate change. There are significant, significant threats to the local um, flora and fauna. What do we actually do? We specialize in reforestation efforts and wildlife habitat reforestation and community engagement programs. And we work closely with volunteers and partner organization to plant trees, create wildlife corridors, and educate communities about the importance of ecological stewardship. So we can see that in three slides, it's pretty clear why is this important now? What's the problem that we're solving? 
And what do we actually do as a nonprofit to solve those problems? We're reframing everything in a way that makes sense for the listener. And it also it's aligned with our values. Then how do we do this? We do this by partnering with local schools, indigenous communities, and environmental experts. And we combine knowledge and resources. We can amplify our impact and enact lasting change across the region. What proof do we have so far? So far, we have planted over 100,000 trees and restored 50 acres of vital wildlife habitat in the past year alone. So that says directly, like, okay, so this organization is real. Like they're actually doing the stuff that they talk about. They're not just words and buzz. They're actually doing things. And we've engaged with over 2,000 volunteers and partnered up with 10 local schools. And it's like a, I wrote this down as like an, an interesting example. We, our efforts at leading the recovery on the recovery of several endangered species, including the Western screech owl. So this is like showing for real that the organization is legit and they're doing something to make a change in the world. And what do we actually need? We rely on generosity to continue to work our vital work. And what we need now is contributions to directly fund tree planting, habitat restoration, and environmental location programs. And we will get you support, whether it's through donations, volunteer or volunteering, or just spreading the word about the mission. Quick recap, so we can have 10 minutes for questions. First of all, the theory of change is part of theoretical evaluation of programs. We need to remember that it's not the ultimate truth. It's what in theory we expect to happen, given the inputs, the activities, the outputs, the outcomes, and the impact. It's in constant change and it needs to be validated. And in this case, assumptions are crucial. Let's try to not overlook assumptions at all. And it's really useful to spend some time talking with your staff and directors and other stakeholders about what are the things that we are assuming. As, as simple and as plainly obvious as they might be. Then it's key to define your nonprofit's vision and mission even before starting to create a theory of change. So your organization knows where to go because the vision and the mission guides everything you do and how you're going to get to where you want to go. And measuring inputs, activities, and outputs, it's simpler than just outcomes and impact. And outcomes and impact should usually be broken down for measure. That's called operationalization, but just broken them down makes more sense. And lastly, the six slide deck can help you communicate your organization's purpose and ask in a simple and direct way. That's it for now. I'm going to stop sharing. Awesome. That's amazing. Thank you. And I love like how you really ended with that very tangible example. Here's an organization in British Columbia, and here's exactly how they could start bringing this yeah. thinking um, and this model into their work. So, uh, so I've got a couple questions here. And for everyone else, hey, God, about so throw something into the chat, and I'm happy to, to be your voice on this one. But a couple quick questions here. Mm -hmm. You could come out theory of change at the big organizational level, yep. bigger organization. Could I just come out and say my team for this one project is just going to take that ourselves through this theory of change process. Do I need to have done the, get the whole organization aligned step, or can I just jump in and do this within the context of our, of a smaller team within the organization? Oh, you can definitely do that just for the team and just for one particular project. There's no need to create the whole thing for the organization itself to then break it down. You can just choose one project. As long as it's aligned with the mission and the vision of the organization, mm -hmm. which will probably be, and maybe that's another work. Well, if the project was approved at all, then it should be a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Exactly. Here's another question. So things change over time. How do people adapt their theory of change as their organization grows and evolves over time? Do you come back to it and start the process from the scratch or like how to how do you come back to this? Mm -hmm. The beauty of it is that you can come back to it at any time and just take one of the outputs or one of the things that you have been testing and see, did they work? Didn't it work? What can we change? And this is a way you can also integrate like agile meetings into your organization, like mm -hmm. having my weekly retrospectives. So we're just talking what went well, what went wrong, and what can we do differently next time? And just create alignment. But the important of this is to be constantly communicating so we're all in the same page and in constant alignment and if everything comes anything comes up just get dealing with it really as fast as possible so it's not the we do it once the five-year plan and then we go and no into it it really needs to be this living 
thing that, that you operationalizing and testing come back to all the time. Yep, exactly. Awesome. You've got all these beautiful templates here. Okay. How could we get access to a cool template like this so we could start doing some of this work within our own organizations and bring in these models? Then so theory of change? Yeah, exactly. Both the pitch deck and then the theory of change where you said, like, how do we work back and the assumptions and all mm -hmm. the ages. Yeah, I'm happy to share the presentation if that's something that's useful for you. And again, there are different approaches to theory of change. Some people use, I, I know a couple of models from Nesta UK also, which is like a big nonprofit that helps nonprofits and social enterprises. And I can also share that really very cool, Nesta UK. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, big fan of the work. And, yeah. yeah. And also another way of doing so, right, let me just share my screen briefly, is, and it's actually really nice because it's on Figma. It's like a Miro board or something. Mm -hmm. So for example, this kind of like another work that I was doing for. So let's say that we have a theory of change for one organization. And so this is for one organization focusing on autism and they have their mission and everything that's clear. And one of the activities involves a particular program. So let's say that they want to create an autism summit program to create awareness, partnerships, and position them as an expert organization in the field. And this would be like the main output. Some summit is created and then we can take that particular program, which is in, in aligning all the organizational structure with all their metrics and how they're actually evaluating it, right? with the social return investment, cost benefit analysis, et cetera. And we can see how this program can be created in a theory of change here. The program has their own target population, which is different than the target population that the whole organization serves because it's more, more niche, more detailed. And then the program itself has a problem itself and has its, it can even have its own outcomes and its own impact. We still need to have the same ambition and the same mission. But we can create like a theory of change for any of the projects that we have. So these are all the things that organization does. And we can take one activity and create a specific theory of change for that activity, which oh gosh, divides so you do like a dozen of these, every single sort of program could have its own version. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Definitely seeing people are pretty excited to have a copy of the presentation. Yeah. I'll make sure nice. include that in the post event email. Another question that often comes is the, oh, there's a lot of measurement into this process, how do I not burn out my poor team who is already <laughs> doing a million other things? Like, how do I take this, this way of measuring and build it into the everyday as opposed to the thing that's going to burn us out first? Like, mm -hmm. how, do I, how do we make it something we can live? I love the question, something livable. There are two ways that I've seen. One, it's getting really clear on what's the vision and especially what's the mission of the organization, because once the mission is clear, everything that you do is aligned under that mission. So you can take for granted that every single one of your activities are geared towards that mission. And also just using the 80, 20 principle, let's say, what is the thing that I could allocate 20% of my time that measures 80% of the results that I want. Mm -hmm. And instead of just measuring absolutely everything, it's important to understand that not everything that counts can be measured and not everything that, that actually can be measured counts or matters. So that's why it's really important to go and check with the stakeholders or the beneficiaries who are, which our organization or program is intended to and see what's the real change they experience. What are the real things that they're valuing? This happens many times that what we think they're valuing or what we think it's valuable for them is not actually the things that they find value in. So once we get clear on that, everything else might fall into place. Fabulous. Thank you so much for taking us through this process and introducing this new model to many of people, including myself. I'm really grateful for your time.